That's it? That's it. All right, here we go. All right, very good. Uh, as Brother Sam mentioned, that our theme this year, or the subject that we want to take up is basically evidences of new life. And the book of First John is the book that we're going to be looking at. And just to mention this, I'm good. Just to mention this, that the First John, there are 10 times in First John. Not all 10 are evident, but 10 times where he talks about being born of God. There's three times where he talks about being begotten of God. But in First John, it's all the same word that's being emphasized. And, and so we want to look at this manner of what does it mean to be born of God? And what are the evidences of born of God? And just before we read this, this afternoon's introduction to where we're going, I just want to mention these places where it's mentioned, this idea of being born of God. And so in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, he says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. This is the first place in the book of 1 John where this idea of being born of God is mentioned. The second then is chapter 3 and verse 9. He says, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Chapter 4 is the next one in chapter 4. And by the way, in chapter 3, verse 9 that we just read, twice, born of God is mentioned there. So that's the first three times that it's mentioned. Then in chapter 4, uh, we see it again in verse 7, where he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And so here's the next place where this is mentioned. Chapter 5, verse 1, we have it mentioned. A careful reading of this, looking at the different uh, words here, you'll see that it's mentioned three times. I'll try to emphasize it. Uh, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, obvious, mm -hmm. and everyone who loves him who begot, there's that same word, also loves him who is begotten. There it is another time, third time in that one verse. Then in chapter 4, uh, uh, sorry, chapter 5 again, in verse 4, chapter 5, verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So here's the next place. And then the last two places it's mentioned is in chapter 5 and verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18, where we read, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. But he who is born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Now, of course, we've read all of these verses out of their context. So I just want to give them to you. And in the course of the week, we're going to be talking about the context of where they fall. One thing that is important for us to understand as we read through the book of First John, is that what we read here, John as a writer, the Gospel of John, he's telling us how it is that you're saved through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who it is that salvation comes from? It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But in First John, he's not talking about how to be saved, it's for those of us who profess to be saved, there's a reality that needs to be seen. And that's what John is dealing with in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John particularly. John writes, and this is important, so make sure you get this. John writes very emphatic in 1st John. Things are very black and white, either or. 
in or out. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area here in 1 John. He's writing very emphatic because he's, he wants to be strong and he wants, uh, he wants his listeners, his readers, to understand the reality that comes with being in fellowship with God the Father and with being in fellowship with God the Son. And so it all begins at new birth. And so as we think of this then, uh, let me just read these verses that we have on the outline. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And then we want to back up a little bit and talk about um, new birth, how it is that we're born of God or born from above, or as some people say, born again. And so this is what we want to look at in today's session. But just to begin, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That life, or the life, that was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested, second time that word's you, manifested to us. That that which is, which we have seen, which we have heard, we declare to you that, or in order that, you may also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you in order that your joy may be full. Now, this is John's heart exercise. John is the one who was the youngest of the disciples. John is the one who leaned upon the bosom of the Lord Jesus. If you read in John 13, you read that he leaned on the bosom. Peter says, hey, hey, ask him, ask him. And then he asked the question. And then he, it says the text in, in uh John 13 says he leaned back on the breast of the Lord Jesus. Two different Greek words. One bosom, one breast. The idea of leaning on the bosom of the Lord Jesus has to do with intimacy and nearness to God. That's John. That's what John's writings really, especially this epistle that we're handling today. That's what this epistle is laying out before us. This manner of intimacy fellowship, nearness to God as our Father and with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The breast, on the other hand, while the bosom speaks of uh, intimacy and nearness, the breast, when it says John leaned back on the breast, same place, different purpose. The intimacy, the nearness, bosom. The breast speaks of Nutrition, it speaks of strength, where the resource of where we get our strength. And that's John is telling us that if we want to give evidence of our Christian life, we want to give evidence that we have this fellowship with the Father. We want to give evidence that we're born of God. Then it comes as we find our strength in a relationship a daily relationship, an intimate relationship with the Father. And so I'll, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to let the brothers uh, jump in here for any other introductory remarks before we make some connections to the Gospel of John and other places. Uh, but I, I just want to lay that as an outline for us where we're going this week, these terms born of God, and the reality that John wants us to have, the intimacy that ought to flow out of being born of God. You see, the Christian life 
is not just about getting your fire insurance and not going to hell. The Christian life is about living a real, intimate life with God the Father. That's what the Christian life is about. It's about your identification with Christ in this world that has rejected him. And it's about getting your resource from him, your strength from day to day. And so this is where we're headed, evidences of new life. And uh, maybe Brother Mark or Brother Sam has a couple of other introductory point, uh, points, and then I'll take us back to a few places in John and other places. One, just a, a quick point. Um, my understanding is that he was also dealing with an issue of something called Gnosticism at this time. And that there were, there were questions about the person of the Lord Jesus. The, the Lord Jesus was truly God and truly man. I'm not sure if you're going to touch on that. But, but the reality is that he was a real man. But yet he was always and is the living God. An amazing thing that nobody can understand. None of us can, can explain. But the reality is that Jesus was truly God. Yet he was truly man. And I think the Gnostics had some weird ideas about, you know. And I don't even, uh, I would have to go into it in more detail. But they had some weird ideas. And if you read the, the introduction, it makes it very clear. They, they touched him. It says that they heard him which we've heard, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon, we've handled. He was a real person. He was real. It wasn't a figment of the imagination. So I think that's one of the key things that is important. He was God, but he was really man. And that's something, that sin apart, no sin. But that's something that is for our hearts to know that. And now, the other thing about it is that right now, he is still a man, but he's risen from among the dead and is at God's right hand. That's something we can enjoy. And I think that that's going to come out in yeah. the fourth study, mm -hmm. um, the, the whole Gnosticism uh, thought that to be born of God is to know that Jesus is the Christ and that he's the son of God. And those, that, that will come. But what Brother Sam just mentioned, there's a thread mm -hmm. from the very opening verses all the way really into uh, Third John. There's that thread that is setting this out for the readers. One of the things we'll discover is we talk about evidence of life and we think take that personally, but the life is really what Christ presents. It's his person. It's Paul was able to capture this in his own experience in saying the life I now live. It's, it's a life that's not originating in ourselves. It's something that God deposits and he says, those are kind of the things that I want to see produced these are the things that are resultant of what this divine act of God is on our lives to bring us into a whole new way of living, a whole new way of thinking. Everything's new. And so um, it's great to start here because Christ fully displays the true evidence of what this life is about. And I love this, the, the introduction. He says, that which we have seen, these disciples... John in particular, but the disciples who spent time with the Lord Jesus, they saw something in his daily experiences that John just wants to capture. And he says, I want you to really get a grasp on this because it's going to lead to this idea of joy. It's going to lead to an idea of making our lives less about what we're doing and more about who we're spending time with who we are in relationship with, because what that will do is produce the right kind of behavior. We are often behavior centric, right? Do this, do this, go here, don't go here, don't do that. But when we are living in the vital relationship that John is describing here of what they witness concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was in John um, one, it says, is the, we beheld his glory. We watched him as he moved in this world and, and something pops out at us and says, man, he is, we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten with the Father. That relationship that the Lord Jesus Christ had with his Father 
was so special, so unique, so on display that John captures it here and says, that's what we look forward to. That's for us to help and enjoy as well. So as we think about this idea then of being born of God, uh, being uh, knowing that we're born of God, there's evidence to know that we're born of God. As we said, it's mentioned 10 times in the epistle. Uh, sometimes it's the word begotten um, or begot, uh, but it's 10 times. It's the same Greek word. And as we think of that then, so we need to stop and just ask the question, well, what does it mean to be born of God? What, what does this really mean? We've already said in our conversation together that it, it has the idea of being born from above. Mm -hmm. Brother Mark mentioned that it is something that God does. And we'll see that, especially when we get to the verse in James, James 1, 18. Uh, we'll see that God has initiated this. This life comes from God himself. But I just want to touch on one other thing that Brother Mark just mentioned. The relationship that God the Father had with God the Son in what we commonly call eternity past. And what we mean by that is before time ever was, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What does that mean? It means that he was, that little word, uh, with, means that he was face to face with God. They enjoyed this intimate relationship together. And that same intimate relationship that the father and son has enjoyed in the, what we call eternity past, time before time was, he desires us to have this similar, unique, it's unique and it's different, but it's similar. And he wants us to have a similar relationship with God as our father, this fellowship that we're talking about. So how is that made possible? Well, let's turn. I'm glad you asked. So to answer your question, we're going to turn to you. To begin with, we're going to look at John 3. We're going to look at Nicodemus. We're going to look at what the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind who Nicodemus was. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus was a religious man. He was a Pharisee. In fact, the Lord Jesus, in the context of the chapter, he says, are you not the Pharisee? In other words, he was tough. And he says, are you not the Pharisee and you don't know? So keep that in mind. But now we'll read uh, verse, starting with verse 1. There, there was a, a man named, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God. For no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay? Now verse 3. Jesus answers. And I love the fact that Jesus doesn't... You know, a lot of times when people make statements or people ask questions, the Lord Jesus doesn't answer them. He comes at it from a whole other point of view. And here's what he said. Jesus answered and said to them, said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or more exact, born from above, mm -hmm. unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, that unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born from above, or born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but it cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So everyone, so is everyone who is born 
of the Spirit. So there's a lot to unpack there. And obviously, probably in the short time that we have, we're not going to unpack it all because we want to get to a couple other verses. But I do want to just show us something and I'll make a statement that, first of all, this manner of being born again, this manner of being born from above has nothing to do with water baptisms. Mm. Mm-hmm. Water baptism's not in the picture here. Mm-hmm. Some will some will teach that this is water baptism. But we hope to be able to show you mm-hmm. that this is not water baptism here. Nowhere in the text is baptism talked about. So when you look at the text, you have to have to not just extract one verse out of the text and say, Oh, this must be water baptism. Mm-hmm. But let's compare scripture with scripture and see what it is and how it is that we're born of God. And so that's the first thing that we want to just make clear. That he's talking about this manner of being born of God or born from above takes place. How? Again, I'm glad you asked. Because we're going to turn to John's gospel, chapter 1, for two verses. And that is... It's hard to jump in at verse 12. What we're doing today is very difficult. It's not the best way of teaching. The best way of teaching is go verse by verse and teach something in the context of where it's found. So what we're doing is we're kind of jumping in. But I need you to see the very first word. That word, but, verse 12. But, it tells you something. It tells you, wait a minute. There's a contrast here being made. The word, but, is a is a word of contrast. And he's saying, in verse 10, he says, he was in the world, and the world, the Lord Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Then it says, and he came unto his own, Mm -hmm. Israel, Mm -hmm. and his own did not receive him. So now he's making a contrast. He's saying, he came to the world, the world didn't see him. The world didn't recognize him. The world didn't receive him. He came unto his own, and his own didn't receive him. But, but, that's the contract. But, as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the authority, the power, that word right. That's what it means. The right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Some of your translations might say sons of God, but really John doesn't deal with sonship. Paul deals with sonship. John deals with family. John John predominantly deals with family. There might be one or two verses where he might mention sons, but predominantly John is dealing with Evidence of being in the family of God. Mm -hmm. Paul picks up this manner of sonship. And there's a difference between sonship and being a child of God. The same, both, we're both, we're children of God, we're in the family of God, but sonship means we have an adult standing before God. It's another subject. Um, Go to Believer's Bookshelf. You can find a little book. Um, I'm not sure if you can trust the author. But there's a book on sonship there by a guy named Tim Hadley. So you can look at that book. But I'll just say this. It says here that he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Believe John deals with this word believe over and over Again, in the Gospel of John, in John's writings, even in his epistles, he talks about belief. Paul doesn't use the word believe so much. Paul uses the word faith. Hmm. Where John uses the word believe, Paul uses the word faith. Same thing. So he's talking about your relationship with God. He's talking about putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this word believe has this idea not talking about like the devil's belief and fear and tremble. Not talking about that kind of belief. It's talking about faith. Okay? It's important that we see that. 
And so then he says in verse 13, who were born not of blood. So it doesn't matter what mm. your family heritage was. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter that you grew up in a Christian home mm -hmm. and mom and dad were a Christian. No, no, no. That's not how you're born again. Mm -hmm. You got to be born from above. Amen. And so he says, just because your parents are Christians, you better make sure. Amen. There's a little verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. It says, examine yourself and see if you're in the faith. It's an important verse. I need to make sure that I'm born from above. Mm -hmm. Am I born again? And so he says, it's not by blood. It's not by your family heritage. It's not by the will of the flesh. In other words, by, by uh, personal effort mm -hmm. and what you do. Not by works you've been saved, right? We could we could quote those verses. Then thirdly, he says, it's not by personal choice. Because mm -hmm. he says, not by the will of man. So it's something else. It's not by my choice. I, I decide, oh, you know what? I'd like to be born of God. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. He says it's not by choice. It's not by the will of man. There's something else involved. Wow. What's he say? He says, but, there's that word again, that word of contrast again, but of God. And I'm going to stop here, and we're going to, we'll go to James, and, and I want to go also to some other verses that show us that it's not water baptism that's being talked about. Maybe one of the brothers will bring this up, uh, but it's the word of God, and it's the spirit of God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God, you're born again, not of corruptible seed, mm -hmm. but of incorruptible seed. We'll bring those verses out. And so it's the word of God, it's the spirit of God. The spirit of God takes the word of God and convicts one who's not a child of God that he needs to be born from above. And so I'll just stop here and let the brothers jump in. Could I make one quick point here as well? That interestingly... We are, it says in, um, in this verse 12, children of God by birth. That's, we're born from above. But it's interesting that we as believers are also adopted as sons. And this is, I know it's a different theme, but it's either in real life, as it were, you're either born into a family or you're adopted, right? It's either or. In our case, in the Christian community, in the Christian family, we are both, we are both, we are born from above. If we truly belong to the Lord Jesus, we have to be born from above and we are adopted as sons. That is something that, again, takes the time to sink in, that we are both, that in, in our, you know, in our everyday life, you're either one or the other. One has to do with your position, your place. The other has to do with your privilege. Mm -hmm. Sonship has to do with privilege. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and uh, so, go ahead, Mark. I opened that can of worms. <laughs> the um, phenomenal thing that when you think about this is that the God of the universe, mm. the God who, by his word, spoke things into being, looks down and he sees failing creatures like you and I and he says, I am going to bring my word and my spirit to bear on these individuals. This is the absolute maximum understanding of grace, that there's nothing that I did to earn it. And so often we are confused in our Christian perspective that I have to do something in order to curry God's favor. These verses tell us, no, that God in his sovereign ways, he brings his word and the work of the Holy Spirit to bear so that new life can be produced in people like you and I. And that's a marvelous thing to just meditate on and to think that his grace sees us and he says, I'm going to impart new life. And the means by which I'm going to do it is through the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will develop this further in the week as an evidence of real new birth. 
realizing that we are born again, and I'm going to read the verse that Tim alluded to in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God. So our birth from above involves the spirit of God taking the word of God to bring about that birth in us. Therefore, we got to be feeding on the word of God. We need, as an evidence, we need to have an enjoyment of the Word of God. We need to have a desire for the Word of God. And this will come out as we go through more and more, but this is to start with. The Word of God is critical in our birth. We, ca we cannot survive without the Word of God, as it were. So a question I have for you is, do you have a desire for the Word of God? If you say you are a Christian, and anybody says that they're a Christian, and they do not have a genuine desire for the Word of God. To me, something is wrong. And think about a natural situation. You have a child. If a person does not want to eat, it could well be that they're sick. Oftentimes, it's, you know, they've got some bug or, or something. But that's a concern. The Word of God is critical in our salvation. And if we have no desire for it, and sadly, sometimes there are some people who call themselves Christians who have who seemingly have very little desire for the Word of God. That's a concern. That's one of the things that we're going to probably mention more than once during this week. But the Word of God is critical. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God to bring about that new birth. That's, all, that's what He does. So one, one of the ways that we can look at this then, by water mm -hmm. and by the Spirit, the water we're suggesting to you is the word of God, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, would remind us that he, he washes us clean, he sanctifies us by the washing of the word. So we're suggesting to you that the, the water here speaks of the word of God. And, and the verse there in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 23, reminds us that it's not by corrupt, by, it's by the incorruptible word of God. So if you would... And be patient with me here. Show me a little bit of grace on this. Just to make it simple so that we can understand this. You have two parents. You have a mom and a dad. So you have two spiritual parents. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. That's how you came about, spiritually speaking. That's how you came into existence, spiritually speaking, from above. And it's Let's not complicate it any more than that. And it's, it's important for us to understand that this wasn't my decision. Mm. And let me show you the verse to back that up. There's many verses that we could look at first. Or we could look at Ephesians chapter one that reminds us that we're chosen before the foundation of the of the world. But we don't want to get into the subject of election today. Um, that's for another time. Talk to Mark privately if you want to talk about elections. But. In James chapter 1, there's a beautiful verse that just sort of capsulizes what we're talking about here. James chapter 1, verse 18, where he says, verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth. How? By the word of truth. There it is. He brought us forth. You know what's interesting? All the words that we've been looking at right now uh, about born of God, all the verses that we looked at in First John, even the verses that we looked on in the Gospel of John, they all mean born from above. Mm -hmm. But this word, of his own will, he brought us forth. It's a different Greek word. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Because this word is the idea of giving birth. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of labor pains. It's the idea of actually giving birth. And for those of us who have been in the labor room, we know what that's like. Not as much as the sisters that were giving birth, but this is what this word means, labor pain. And so when we think about this, he says, he brought us forth. He, he birthed us into existence. How? By the word of God, by the word of truth, he said. And that's one of the things that John is so adamant about, is this little word truth. Mm -hmm. 
And we have it in the Gospels. We have it also in the Epistles. I wanted to, um, Sam just mentioned one of the evidences is that there is a, a love for the Word of God. I want to even go back further. Check your testimony. When you think or when you think back to when you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what were the scriptures that the Spirit of God used to affect and touch your heart? If you can't put your finger on them, I suggest you get a little bit alone by yourself and open the Word of God to find those scriptures in which your own soul come under, came under conviction. Otherwise, you have to question. You have to, Will there be evidence? Because it starts with the Word and the, continues with the Word. And so if you cannot base your testimony, if you can't convey your testimony with a connection to the Word of God, I suggest that you do some work to get there. Many of us, by God's grace, we were raised in very comfortable, safe environments, and our parents loved us, and they taught us the Word of God, and we, oh, yes, yes, I believe, Mommy, because Mommy and Daddy say so. Or we are in environments where the Word of God is being taught, and, you know, we want to be numbered with everyone else and say, yeah, 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 I believe. But what scripture did the Spirit of God use to convict you of your sin and then point you to the Savior? You got to have him. You got to hold on to him. You don't want to know why? Because when the, the troubles of life and John is dealing with and helping the brethren here to deal with the false teachers and all the crazy thing that was going on in this time, he says, when trouble comes and difficulty comes, that's what's going to be your anchor. Not your feelings, not your experience, the truth. And so I just encourage everyone to just sort of when we leave here and you're in a little quiet moment by yourself, reflect on your journey and say, what scriptures did God use to convict me of what my need was and show me who the Savior was? So just to give us this again, Romans chapter 10 <laughs> Verse 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so this is what we're underlining just to reemphasize Mark's point is why, why are we saying the word of God is so important? Because you're born again by water, by the word, and by the spirit of God. And so the, the spirit of God takes the word of God. When you look at what the spirit of God's function is, mm -hmm. In John chapter 16, for example, and you see what it is that the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus was talking about, another comforter is going to come. Another meaning one just like me. Another comforter is going to come. And when he comes, what is he going to proclaim? He's going to convict the world of sin, says, and, and of righteousness and of judgment. And so the first thing that Mark just mentioned was conviction. This is the work of the Spirit of God. Well, what does the Spirit of God use but the Word of God? And so we just want to um, yeah, emphasize that. But to the point of Brother Sam about the craving that we have, craving the Word of God, uh, I, I want to give us that verse in 1 Peter chapter 2 um, because... You know, years ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about 40 years ago or so, mm -hmm. I asked the Lord to give me a hunger for the Word of God, to take away other desires. I'll, I'll just be transparent. Listen, I loved action movies. I grew up in, in act, action act, uh, contact sports. So I loved action movies. And I wept in God's presence, asking him to take that desire away. I'll just be further transparent and say it's not 100% gone. So pray for me, brethren. Just being real. But you need to know that what God will do when you ask the Father and you get into his presence... I want to have this fellowship with you. 
I want to have this intimacy with you. Take away the desires that aren't going to lead that direction and give me a craving for your word. Because it's through your word, oh God, that I know. I mean, David, the, the might not have been David, um, the writer of Psalm 119, could have been Ezra, but the, the writer of Psalm 119, he wrote, and every verse in that chapter, but maybe one or two, has to do with the word of God and the importance of the word of God in that man's life. And so I want a craving for the word of God. I want all the other stuff in life to drop off. And so just to read this verse in First Peter chapter 2, verse 2, as newborn babes, sorry, I can't do that. I got to back up to verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. I'm just pausing for a minute. Ask the question. How often do we speak about other people in a negative way? We got, we got to be done with that. Brothers and sisters, we need to be done with that. We need to put that out. Ask the Lord, help you not to be a gossiper. Ask the Lord to help you not say negative things about somebody else. But ask the Lord, as newborn babes, desiring the pure milk of the word, that you might grow thereby, if indeed, if indeed, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. That's Peter's way of saying, if you're indeed born of God. And Peter talks about being born of God in chapter 1. He talks about being born of God, born from above. He talks about that. He says we're born for glory as believers. And so this is his way of saying, if you've tasted and you know that you're a Christian, then you have a desire for the word of God. Ask the Lord for a desire. You know, I think it's about verse 7 of this text in First Peter chapter 2. talks about he's precious. Uh, yeah, in verse seven. yeah, verse 7. Thank you. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. He is precious. Stories told about a, a lady who, your sisters might be able to identify with this, uh, a, a, a lady who liked to read this, a certain writer. She just really enjoyed this writer. And she read everything she could about this writer. And this writer became so precious to her that one day she got to meet the writer. And she felt like she already knew him because she's read all of his material. And, and she, long story short, they got married. Because she loved him so much by what he wrote. He was precious to her. That's what I want in my relationship with the Lord. To show us that we're born from above. That he might become more and more precious to me. And that the things of this earth would grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Mm -hmm. To add something, as I look in the audience, I, I see faces who were at camp recently and, uh, and are believers. And I just want to bring out the point that therefore, if we are given an opportunity to speak to somebody about the Lord Jesus, a person who needs to be saved, it isn't our persuasiveness, our fancy use of words, that's going to really make the difference. It may set the background, but the key thing to present to people when we preach the gospel or speak to others is the Word of God. We, we need to have a knowledge of the Word of God that's appropriate to give to that person. Because the Spirit of God will use the Word of God in their souls, not my fancy words. It's the word of God. So I just want to, I see people here that I, I can see when we are preparing to speak the word of God or to preach, use the word of God. I, I remember in England, I heard a story about this. 
that there was uh, a, a, a person who was supposed to speak, didn't come, and then there was a snowstorm, and this person came in off the street. And the speaker wasn't, wasn't eloquent. And all the person did was to repeat a passage or repeat a portion of the Word of God. And that person who came in off the street, got saved, and became a, a really notable person. I heard that years ago. It's the Word of God that the Spirit of God does to really work in our souls. So when we preach, use the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that will draw out my own heart to see the preciousness of the Lord. And when we come back to 1 John, we kind of straight away, well, I want to bring us back to 1 John again. This manner of fellowship. Uh, you know, we, at the outset, we said about our Christian life, evidence of, our, of new life. You know, the key to the Christian life is the first six letters of the word Christian. Christ. Christ. That's the key. It's all about him. It's not about high and lofty truth. It's all wonderful. It's great. Be able to rightly divide the word of truth is important. Be able to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. Important. But if you do that without seeing Christ, you just become another Pharisee. This is so important. Don't leave Christ out of your Christianity. Develop your relationship. And, and I want to emphasize this. Who is God to you? Is God far off at a distance? God. The creator? God. Elohim? The creator? Or do you know him as your Abba Father? This is so important. That we understand that the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, Galatians chapter 6, 4, sorry, 4, that the Spirit testifies with my spirit that I'm a child of God, and the Spirit cries out within me. This is Galatians. The Spirit cries out within me, Abba, Father. But in Romans... It's a little different in Romans 8, where you get the emphasis of the power of the Spirit of God. In Romans 8, the, it says, we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, of course, we do it through the Spirit. But it's because the Spirit of God has enlightened us. The Spirit of God has, has ignited that spark plug. And, and we realize this relationship we have with God as our Father based on the finished work of the Lord Jesus, based on his resurrection, based on the fact that he told Mary, touch me not yet because I've not yet ascended unto my father. But, but, but go and tell my brethren that I'm going to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. You notice the order? The manner of father comes before the manner of God. So if God is just God at a, at a, off at a distance, something's missing. So we, we want to encourage you. Develop your relationship on your knees with God the Father. With him as your loving father. And, and with the Lord Jesus Christ, his beloved son. And the reason those two things go together, because the Lord Jesus said, I and my father are one. Amen. And so you can't have a relationship with one without having a relationship with the other. And so I just want to emphasize this, young people, because so many of us live life and we talk about God this and we talk about God that and we never talk about the Father. Hmm. And I want to bring us, we need to change that. I want to bring us to a place where we talk about God as our loving Abba Father. You know, the first time I ever heard Giddy Leviton, the first time I was in Giddy's home, his boys were very little. And they come running up to him and said, Abba, 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 Abba. I said, oh, this is scriptural. <laughs> and, and he would scoop him up in his arm. You know that we use that language. That's sonship language. I'll just share one verse and I'm going to turn it over. One verse. 
in Mark chapter 14. You can find the verse later. In Mark chapter 14, when the Lord Jesus, it's only recorded in Mark, but when the Lord Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Abba, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. You know what? When, when we use the term Abba, or we don't have to use the term, but when we're in the good of God as our Father, that's sonship. That's, that's sonship language. How wonderful is that? And so I just want to encourage us. He says that our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. John is looking for reality. One of the things that's interesting, too, is if you read through particularly John's gospel, um, particularly chapter 5, one of the things that we learn about how the Lord Jesus manifested this relationship, he, he was so dependent. He said, I don't even speak things that I haven't heard my father speak. Um, he was so intimately connected with the Father in everything that he did, everything that he said. I do nothing of myself, he says. And so we talk about what this life looks like when the disciples walk with the Lord Jesus and they just observed him. This relationship that he had with his Father was so pronounced, so real, so palpable that they desired to do the same things that he did. They wanted to, to, to follow and to, to experience the same things he experienced. And so it's very, very, very vital for us to just appreciate this thought that we just had, that our relationship with God as our Father is more important than following a set of rules and dictums. It's more important than following a set of do's and don'ts. It's about loving he who has loved us. To give us this life. And, and why is this so important? You know, it, it's important because John says, and, and, notice verse 4, there's a bridge he's building, and he says, and, whenever you see that word and, it means that here's a connection. It's like a Legos, you know, when you connect them. This fits on this. That's what he's saying. And these things, the whole purpose of what I'm about to write you, and as you read through First John, he, he'll say this many times. He'll say, this is the reason I'm writing. This is the reason I'm writing. Well, here's the first one of those. And he says, the reason I'm writing is that your joy might be full. He says, I want your joy to be overflowing. I want your Christian life to be vibrant. I want it to be overflowing that everything on the ground is around is, is green because there's so much water overflowing, right? This is the idea here. He says, I want you to be a joyous Christian. And there's so many Christians that if that's Christianity, I don't think I want it. If that's Christianity, I mean, there's so many people. I mean, let's face it. They look like they've been sucking on lemon juice. <laughs> That's not Christianity. Yes, there's times we're sad. There's times when we grieve and there's times. But you know what? Even at the worst time in my life, when I had the worst, uh, saddest thing in my life, there was a joy that the world couldn't give me. That's what we're talking about. This joy. And that's evidence. And so the rest of the week... We're going to be looking at start on Tuesday. Tomorrow's a missionary day. So starting on Tuesday at one o'clock, we're going to be one fifteen on Tuesday. Sorry. Thank you. We're going to be looking at this subject. We're going to be taking up next uh, the, the manner of practical righteousness as evidence that we've been born of God. And we're going to look at that first uh, born of God in John first John two. And then on the next day, which will be Wednesday, we're going to be looking at this manner of love, true biblical love, to demonstrate that we're born of God. How can I say that I'm born of God and 
And I talk about Mark behind his back. Okay, that got real personal real quick. <laughs> but then on Thursday, we're going to look at this manner of faith. Exercising faith. In what? In Christ and as in the Lord Jesus as Christ and in the Lord Jesus as Son of God. And then the last day on Friday, we're going to look at this manner of being born of God. I become an overcomer. And this is really important. And that'll take us on a very high, uh, climactic mountaintop that we want to finish on. So we trust that today's been helpful to get us started. And maybe one of the brothers here will close in prayer.